can all guess what everybody wants to know. But is it Ishai or Ashley? Ishai. 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 So Laura says Ishai. I'm not even going to put it up for a poll. So it's officially Ishai from here on out. Yay! Um, presenting today, Carrie Neifeld from the, the Assistant Secretary for Human Services in the New York State Executive Chamber of the Office of the Governor. Moira Tashian, Associate Commissioner, New York State Office of Mental Health, Adult Community Care Group, Division of Adult Services. Sean Fitzgerald, Assistant Commissioner for Capital Development, New York State Homes and Community Renewal. And Richard Umholtz. Director, New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance. So welcome. I'm Mark Fuller. I run a nonprofit in uh, upstate New York. And believe it or not, upstate's not Westchester for you those. <laughs> <laughs> we're primarily in Rochester and Buffalo. Uh, but I get that all the time. Like when I say we're upstate, it's like everybody thinks it's Westchester. Uh, or, geez, I'd love to come see one of your programs when I'm in Albany. I'll call you for lunch. Uh, <laughs> so that's a big state. So we're going to really, uh, I think, just start and have uh, each of the uh, panelists uh, talk and present on their topic, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions. I know we are the last uh, session before cocktails, so it's always a tough time of day. So, Carrie, all yours. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to talk generally about the governor's priorities and the housing plan in general, and then obviously let the agency experts talk more in details. Um, I think w people have talked um, quite a bit today about this year's enacted budget um, and the fact that it provides two and a half billion dollars for a five-year commitment to affordable and supportive housing. Um, and 950 million of that is specifically for the first 6,000 units of the governor's 20,000 unit commitment um, for supportive housing that he talked about in the 2016 State of the State Address. <coughs> So um, at the state, we're very excited in the governor's office and the state, this is a really unprecedented commitment to supportive housing. And we're particularly grateful to Shinny and to the provider, to our members of Shinny and or not members of Shinny for the work that you do um, and for the support as we've been trying to get this passed in the budget. Um, on the Saturday after the budget was supposed to have passed um, and hadn't yet passed, I was on the phone with McLean, who many of you know was on maternity leave or still is on maternity leave, and she was graciously working on things. And Laura was at a personal family event and left that event to call me back and help us, um, you know, do the advocacy on behalf of getting the housing plan passed. And we're all really grateful um, that it did. So, just a little bit of background. Last year, at this time, we started um, the governor and the state agencies started to focus quite a bit on the problem of homelessness that was, um, you know, had been growing, was still growing, um, and the governor really started to focus on this as a problem that he couldn't tolerate anymore. Um, so that um, response was, you know, multi-pronged. You know, part of that was to do the work in the homeless shelters to make sure that shelters were a more safe and more supportive environment to help folks who were homeless, um, understanding inevitably that people will experience homelessness. And then obviously the second part was this unprecedented investment in affordable and supportive housing, um, which has brought us to um, Ishai, to the development of Ishai. Um, and for those who don't know, last year was Ishai's first year um, in, in, um, in existence. And that was really the culmination, the first year of Ishai was really the culmination of the work of these guys here and the other state agency partners who had been working for about a year and a half or a year up to that point to, to work together really in a way that um, state agencies hadn't done before. Um, and that's another thing that the governor and the governor's office are really proud of the state agencies for doing, um, for creating this multi-agency RFP that would provide supportive services and rental subsidy to homeless individuals that had special needs and, um, and other subpopulations. So I'm looking at my notes, I don't wanna forget anything. Um, um, folks have talked today a little bit about how about the absence of a New York New York four agreement um, and I think in some ways the state is really proud of the ways that Ishai is different than the previous New York New York agreements and that it really focuses on um, the needs of the community and what the communities are telling us they need for um, to, to address the problem of homelessness there um, it it incorporates the um, working with the continuums of care um, which is something that Governor Cuomo was very proud of having worked on when he was at HUD um, and I think we're really proud that, that we're working with the communities in that way. Um, and just lastly, I want to say that um, even though the RFP is out the door, the first RFP is out the door, and the work is really ongoing now, 
um, supportive housing, addressing homelessness, Eshai in particular are things that the governor's office remains really focused on and um, the governor himself stays really engaged with what's happening and right down to knowing like the number of units that have been allocated for certain subpopulations and these guys um, come to the governor's office on a monthly basis and meet with me and my colleagues at DOB um, and really just sort of talk through each project and what's happening and really in an effort to triage what's happening with the applications and where units are going and get an understanding of what's happening because it's really important to the governor um, and, it, and it will remain that way. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, these guys, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, it's so glad to see everybody in uh, at this conference today. I love these conferences because you get to see everyone you never get to see for a whole year. So um, thank you for having us. I'm going to piggyback on some of what Carrie already said about the background. Uh, when in August 2015, when we first came together as an interagency work group, we all came with our own agenda, meaning that we all had populations of individuals that we worked with. And we quickly learned that it really has to do with the person, not the population at the table, and that we wanted to work together to address the homelessness issue and put aside any kind of challenges as a whole we might have within our own population subgroup. So uh, for the first, since August 15th, for the first year until it was released a year ago today, we really did work and continue to work side by side understanding where each other is coming from. We came to the table with very different languages, all meaning the same thing, but different words meant different things to different people. So we really had to create that bond within this group of understanding our expectations from the Office of Mental Health, the expectations from OTDA, from OASIS. We had to work in understanding other subpopulations, not our, just our own. So the interagency work group consists of nine state agencies, and that's um, DOH, and the AIDS Institute, uh, HCR, OASIS, OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services, OMH, OPDV, the Office of Prevention of Domestic Violence, OTDA, and also even though uh, OPWDD was not part of uh, the ESHI actual um, RFP last year, they were still part of our work group. Um, and you know we've uh, always welcomed their input. Um, so it was, it was very collaborative, continues to be. I can say for since August 5th, 2015, every single Tuesday from 2.30 to 4, everybody gets together. And it, we have never missed a meeting other than you know a day off or if it's a planned schedule, everyone is in attendance representing their agency. I think that says a lot. It says a lot about commitment and commitment to solve a problem and a commitment to really meet the individual's needs, not our own personal uh, agency agenda or mission. So I think that's important to note as we move forward. As Carrie was saying, you know, each application ties back to what is the need for that population in that community. So one of the things we learned early on is not everybody goes through the continuum of care for various reasons, not because they're not welcome to the table, but because there's limitations for certain subgroups, such as uh, domestic violence. They can't, uh, by law, can't uh, submit names in the HMIS, HMIS? Yeah. HMIS. HMIS, yeah, <laughs> yeah those things I have to learn, system. So we had said, well, where are they gonna get their information? So we, we sat there, we brainstormed, well, where do you get your information? So we talked about there's a continuum of care, there's federal reports, there's state reports, there's local government, local planning. So it, it's a combination of what meets the needs for that population group to support the fact that there's a need in their community. So, you know, that's what we put in and will continue to put in as um, a need. As you know, it's up to $25,000 for service and operating. Um, and individual applicants, you know, we had 155 applications come in, 122 uh, got conditional awards. Um, and I have to say that uh, from my vantage point, I think people were very uh, honest about what their need was. Not everybody asked for $25,000. People asked for what their need in their community was. So uh, I think people should be commended for that because there was a fear that everybody was going to ask for 25, even if you didn't need it. You know, in in whatever small community 
that has really low rent. I don't know. Um, but it was a, uh, I was going to name something, but I was like, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, cross the board, okay, everybody gets 25000 didn't happen. So that's a really a positive thing. Um, linkages. Uh, service and operating uh, is linked to capital. Okay, so an individual has to receive a conditional award, starts out with a conditional award, but then they need to secure their capital. When they secure their capital, they come back to that work group that we talked about. And uh, with the supporting documentation and conversation, we'll as a group say yes, send the permanent announcement. So then the agency receives their permanent award. Um, right now there's 741, 741 uh, permanent awards. Uh, Rick does a tracking, that's so I'm like, how many? 741 uh, permanent awards out of 1,200 have already been made. And um, you know, each week, each Tuesday, we evaluate what came in that week. All right, and then we'll work with the Department of Budget or the Division of Budget. And at the Division of Budget, they'll do their planning for that contract whenever that contract comes into play. So in some cases, it could be in 12 months, six months, 32 months. It depends, okay, on what the project is. Um, individuals from all of the populations, uh, services are tailored to what is the need for that population. It's not a cookie cutter, These, this is what everybody receives. It's still very individualized and focused on that person's needs within that population being served. So we don't want to ever lose that and make it become just so rote that you get this with this much money, there's an options and a menu of services for individuals. Um, along those lines, going back to the work group, we do a lot of problem solving. We do a lot of conver a lot of talking, a lot of conversation with both Chamber, with Carrie, um, as you were saying, and with uh, DOB. Uh, when we're trying to figure out how something's going to work because at the end of the day we want to be able to say yes we want to be able to make this work there should be no barriers that we create so how do we get around those barriers if we foresee them so uh, you know I have to tell you personally uh, I've never worked in such a positive collaborative way as we are now we've always had as we were talking earlier informal relationships and I know you're going to talk a little bit about that, but certainly uh, now we have a real team of people uh, that work together very closely for the benefit of uh, individuals in all life challenges and disabilities who are homeless in New York State. So at that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions and we'll hopefully provide lots of answers. But before I go, because <laughs> this is what happens, I just don't stop talking. So, uh, True. <laughs> uh, you know, so everybody today is coming up today. Do you have an announcement? Do you have an announcement? Do you have an announcement? Um, we have sort of an announcement. Uh, there will be a release early next week of our next Eshai route. So that will be early next week. Okay. So look for it. Look for it. Um, it's exciting. It's a little bit different from last year. Um, we have, uh, aside from all of the population served, uh, we will have, it's DOH, AIDS, OASIS, OCFS, OMH, OPDV, OTDA, and OTDA covers a lot of categories. It's homeless, it's vets, it's re-entry, um, and we will have, and we welcome to the table OPWDD as well. So uh, we have a spectrum of services, and we're excited to roll out at least 1,200 units in the upcoming year. So look for that early next week. Sure. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. We're in a week to go. So, uh, so a coworker of mine was in a meeting earlier this week, and it was a group of people that internally at HCR talking about Eshi, and the, in particular the Eshi interagency work group. And someone who wasn't familiar with the work said, well, who, "Who's in charge of that work group?" <laughs> and there was some, you know, uncertainty. And then finally, someone who had attended the latest, uh, the last interagency work group said, oh, "Moira, <laughs> Moira was the <laughs> boss." <laughs> uh, and it really, uh, Moira, you do deserve a lot of credit for the oh. hard work you do coordinating. <laughs>
But I have to say, it, it, it is a decision-making group that really is equal, and we try very hard to base every decision on consensus because it affects everyone. And we're, we're lucky to have the group we're working with, and thank you, Sean. No, I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, to some degree, HCR is an odd, uh, odd agency out. Um, and you know, to Moira points out, we, we, we talk different languages. And I think uh, this really has been a good opportunity for our agency to learn a lot more of the supportive housing language. Uh, we pretended, I think we did a good job of fooling lots of people into believing that we really knew supportive housing. But I think the uh, routinization of our work, the form formalization of the collaboration that for years had been taking place has really cemented uh, our understanding of you know, how difficult it is and the challenges uh, that are involved in providing support of housing. So, um, and to speak to the interagency bonding uh, that has occurred, I think a lot of that uh, stemmed from the summer 2016 Eshai scoring camp that took place. Uh, this was a case where we had a very focused goal on getting the awards out as quickly as possible. And it really was a team effort that involved how many dozen staff person across the agencies? 49. All right. Um, and including HCR. And you know, everyone was so excited to spend August focusing on each other. Not at the track. Not at the track. <laughs> uh, and we had some unhappy campers. But I've got to say, at the end of the day, the people who came back were vested in the Eshi effort. And that's saying something from a bricks and sticks agency like HCR. They were part of the process that evaluated the service and operating. And that was definitely uh, meaningful. Um, and so sort of looking back, and, and I shouldn't take it for granted that everybody knows how HCR deployed uh, funds or how we integrated our processes with Eshi. Uh, to a large degree, Eshi and our funding rounds were synchronized uh, to an extent that we've never synchronized before with supportive housing. Um, you know, we deliberately timed our funding round for the annual competitive 9% round to sync up with the Eshi awards. We provided a separate early award funding date for Eshi projects. Uh, it was the first time we've ever done uh, something of that sort. We from the time that we got our applications in, in uh, the standard round in December, the focus on supportive housing, in Eshi in particular, was uh, more so than ever. Uh, it really was the topic that kept on coming up throughout the process. How are we doing? These, you know, what are they looking like? Good applications, great. Uh, and it really never slipped to uh, off anyone's radar. It was a, a real commitment that started, uh, I, I would say, under uh, uh, Deborah Van Amerongen's leadership in, 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 you know, when she was chair, a commissioner of HCR. Um, uh, but it, it has reached a point where it is one of the primary focuses of what we do um, every day in our agency. And that's, that's a, a, an amazing turnaround from where things were in 2008 when I started working uh, at HCR. Um, and as far as uh, the unified funding process, uh, this year I think we're going to see almost a replay in terms of the timing uh, that we saw last year um, with the release of the Eshi uh, RFP. It's pretty much on schedule with last year. So if you recall how we handled last year, <coughs> early award deadline for Eshi and standard round, you're going to see pretty much a replay of that this year. Um, so I'm sure folks are going to have some questions, so. Um, <coughs> Thanks. Um, it's late in the day, <coughs> and I'm last, so I know from all of my coursework on public speaking, I either have to be dynamic <laughs> or brief. So I hope you enjoy the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll be somewhere in the middle. Um, so OTDA, um, as mentioned, is, is part of the interagency uh, work group, and um, from two different sides. Um, obviously, from the services and operating and, and um, 
you know, the, the contracts associated with a wide variety of um, populations served under each act, but also from the capital, um, much like our colleagues. So, uh, um, you know, one of the things that I, that I do want to say is that HHAP has a long-standing uh, collaborative working relationship um, with HCR on our capital program, and ESHI just added to that kind of marriage and that collaboration and enhanced everything. So um, it's, it's been great, and it really enhanced what has been started for a number of years. Um, but before I kind of talk about any particulars, I do want to recognize, do we have, other than us, interagency work group members in the audience? Stand up, please. All right, I know there's more back there. There we go. Um, these guys have made the commitment for that community. Um, and also, um, OTDA folks, if you could stand up. We have Jason, who's our ESHI contract manager. Um, Linda Kamoins is assistant director of our services. And Dana um, oversees our capital program. And the reason why I introduce those um, folks because they make it happen on a, on a daily basis. And if you haven't sought them out, I encourage you to share ideas and talk to whatever particular projects, ideas that you may have. Um, but back to each other. Um, so. It's his own personal commercial. It's not in the script. <laughs> still love you. <laughs> uh, so, so when we talk about um, ESHI and the marriage with HHAP, um, it, it's worked out well, as many of you know. How many folks in the room have an HHAP project? Raise your hand. All right. Okay. Nice. Um, fair amount. How many have never heard about HHAP? Okay. Um, so seek Dana out. She's spending the night, and she'll spend all night talking. About it. Uh, uh, so one of the things about HHP is um, it does have an open procurement. So uh, the RFP, um, much like Moira had an exciting announcement for those of you who've been waiting. Um, early next week, I would look for that particular uh, request for proposals being available. And it's really um, accepting applications on an ongoing basis. HHMP is our capital program. Uh, it marries well, exceedingly well with each I as intended. Um, and I think it was about five years ago, six years ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer, HHMP moved to an open um, or continuously accepting um, applications. And the intent behind that, 2010, so seven years, uh, many great years later. Um, <laughs> And the intent behind that was to get closer to shovel-ready projects. So um, as opposed to um, waiting 12 months for an announcement of an award, because that was kind of the length of between an open window uh, kind of process and when we were announcing the awards, we moved closer. We moved to an open RFP with the intent for shovel-ready projects. And um, essentially every two months, um, which is consistent with our board meetings, announcing um, projects that were under review as to whether or not they were moving forward with an award or encouraging folks to kind of receive our technical assistance. Um, so that procurement and that style works well and is really, really flexible with a number of different um, programs. ESHI for one, um, and solve, also ESHI kind of solves that which comes first, chicken or the egg, but it also allows projects to come into HHP when they're ready. Sometimes it's before um, blended funding with HCR, sometimes it's after. Um, so it's really when your project is ready. Did I do yeah. program two? Okay. Um, so as it relates to HHP um, or ESHI, kind of in addition to serving on the member, as um, Moira indicated, OTDA also um, has the responsibility to the tracking. Um, as a whole. So it's both on the capital side um, as well as the um, services and operating. And um, I don't know why I brought that up other than you mentioned it before. Well, it's, it's important because everyone needs to know that we are tracking all of it. We are looking at all of it. It's not, you know, we've dropped this and we're moving on to something, but this is a continual process and it's being reviewed. You know, one of the uh, things that we decided early on, and we, I use the big we, is the state of New York. Um, 
it was decided from really the governor's office that we would do these on an annual basis. Why do we do that? Because we learn something every year. And, um, and that allows us the following year to make those adaptations and changes for whatever the need is then versus putting something in place and 15 years later the needs are different. Um, so, so it gives us a lot of flexibility um, and that flexibility uh, allows that creativity but we couldn't do that without the tracking piece to make sure we're on track and monitoring as we go forward. So. And then closing, and then I think we have questions to answer, yeah. right? Um, so just by show of hands, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't. How many folks are familiar with Grants Gateway? How many folks receive notification when funding is available through Grants Gateway? A lesser amount. So um, a little bit of an advertisement for Grants Gateway. Um, uh, as many of you guys know, a lot of the funding from the state level comes through Grants Gateway, um, whether it's services, um, whether it's other funding opportunities, but it's normally associated with document vault, right? So that's the document vault where all the due diligence documents are housed and kind of um, a little bit about your compliance efforts um, as a not-for-profit. There's also another functionality of Grants Gateway, um, it's on the main page <clears throat> excuse me, that um, asks if you want to receive notifications about funding opportunities. Um, and you simply go in there and you register via your email. Um, it's not necessarily by state agency or by agency or anything. Um, I would encourage everybody um, to uh, sign up for that because as funding opportunities are released in the state, I would say particularly grant opportunities, 90% of them are released, um, at least an announcement released through Grants Gateway. So it's a good way to stay in contact with the funding across, regardless, not only our state agencies that are represented here, uh, but any funding that's um, grant-oriented um, coming out of the state agency. Before we go to Mark, I just have um, a question also, just to get a pulse. Who here has a conditional award? An ECI conditional award. Oh, that's a good point. All right, mm -hmm. who has a permanent award already? You do. One, two, two, three. All right. I see a couple people who also do. Okay. All right. Just trying to get a sense. So. All right. Well, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions, but before we start, you kind of, uh, well, one, you answered the big question in the room that we all we appreciate it. We look forward to next week. Uh, but you began to mention what, you know, changes and every year is going to modify. What did you learn from this year's Ishai Award period, and what changes can we look forward to? Or expect in year two. Okay. Let me start. All right. Uh, you know, lessons learned. Uh, it was only the first year, so we haven't learned a lot yet. You know, ask me next year about year one, right? Because you have to do a look back a little bit. But we have learned. Uh, we had a lot of feedback during the RFP process, uh, during the question and answer period, as well as during the evaluation period, that we needed to be a little more clear in our, in our RFP in certain areas. So we have incorporated those changes into um, this year's RFP. Um, we have also, you know, as I said, we brought to the table, or the, uh, to the table now is OPWDD, um, and we're looking at at least uh, 1,200 units of housing. Um, we also have brought to the table that, um, in a positive way, just that our collaboration makes it easier to move things forward. Um, and I think that's a real positive lesson we learned. Um, I would just add from you know, some of the conversations that, that have been shared with myself as a specific to ESHAP, that the um, RP itself and um, the administration of the program is really flexible. Um, and we kind of learned that if you look back 12 years ago or 14 years ago, um, even sometimes even within the state agency, there was very much a siloed approach to service funding. Um, and you're constantly kind of chasing um, services and operating dollars, right? Um, what we've learned is the success of ESHI bringing all of the target populations into one services and operating procurement that cross state agencies. 
um, was the flexibility that is making capital projects work. Um, it allows services and operating the, the uh, SNO kind of uh, conditional award leverage um, the capital resources and also kind of stabilize operating budgets as they're competing for um, capital funds. So I, th I think that's the, yeah. the feedback. It's not so much a lesson learned, but it's a, right. the, the initial feedback that it's working, right? It, and I think there was an earlier session today where um, there was several of the not for profits in the room saying that it worked. Um, that the intended vision um, and the intent, it worked. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that was probably the biggest takeaway I had that there was a collective uh, uh, you know, apprehension uh, about what this was going to do to our process, how confusing it was going to be, how we were going to manage it, and it went off very seamlessly. There were some things that we had to tweak uh, in terms of our application so that we got the information we needed in order to underwrite the projects. But we asked for that as part of our application. It was no big deal. But it worked well, and that was the big takeaway. And then I'll cover, go ahead. That's good. Yeah, and then I'll cover something. Um, I think one of the questions was what's different <coughs> about this year than maybe next year? Right, what exactly. we anticipate? There was a reason why we talked about grants gateway. Mm -hmm. What's going to be different is that the application will be through the grants gateway process. Um, so, uh, you know, we're le leveraging the technology. The, the intent behind that is um, the I think, it, although the process in itself may not be expedited, I think it's going to be easier for all that are involved in terms of the applications and the coordination and, and awards and the review and that sort of stuff. So we're really leveraging today's technology um, to assist with the administering of ESHA that is kind of cross-agency. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. The other positive thing that came out of this, and there was a fear that it wouldn't uh, withstand everyone coming together, is that there are unique needs for each agency and population. Um, and those unique needs have not changed, even though the process is different. So for example, um, when we talk about Olmstead, OMH is pretty strict about the fact that there's no more than 50% can be uh, for mental health. Um, as far as population in the building. But if you have uh, just a, a general homeless population or a vets, a veterans who are homeless, that's not a disability group that falls under Olmstead. So they don't have to follow those same Olmstead outlined regulations. There are other agencies that that, um, that 50% might be 60% or 30%. And how the actual program is administered, as I was saying earlier, is based on the needs of that population. We haven't lost that. Um, so that will remain the same. Some of the nuances are going to be that there may be individual uh, uh, projects that have multiple populations within that building. Yeah. So if I'm a person who I'm running an agency, but I'm a mental health agency, and now I'm going to have an HIV AIDS population in my building, you know what? It's incumbent upon that agency then to understand what's necessary for those folks. Uh, that are not mental health folks. So we'll, there'll be some cross training that will be done so we can ensure that the right services are provided to the right population for the right reasons. So that is something that wasn't lost. Um, so I think that's a lesson learned that we were a little fearful of. And you know, as I said, this is year one. I think uh, year three, year five, those are the look backs where we have to really say, okay, what did we accomplish? How did we accomplish it? How did we accomplish it? And what could we have done different or what should we do different? Can I just add to that? Um, I think one of the things that's not necessarily a lesson learned, but something that we're actively working on now is what Moira was just talking about, that we have um, buildings or we have individuals who are homeless, they're also a vet, they also have mental illness, or they're HIV AIDS positive. So we're, we're trying to take a look at, I mean, I think with everything that we do, we want to evaluate, we want to have results, we want to see what it is that we're doing to inform, you know, what we do, obviously to help secure future funding. And 
So one of the things that we're working on now as we meet on a monthly basis is how can we capture the whole person who's living in this unit? This is not just a person that has mental illness or that is diagnosed with this disorder, um, but this is also a person who has all these other things and you know, engages in the community in this way. And you know, what kind of reporting mechanisms can we put in place for Eshi that are unique um, that can show us exactly what we're doing with this money so that we can go out and say, like, look at what we're doing. This is really great. Give us some more, you know? <coughs> and we will. Yeah. Yes. One, one last kind of lesson learned is that um, the six month time frame yes. to secure capital um, was probably shorter um, or it, it was harder to meet than, than probably anticipated. Um, so I think that was um, a lesson learned and uh, that probably 12 months is uh, a better fit. Right, and, and we were able to make that change midstream, and that's why there was the extension to a 12-month period. So from this point forward, I think what you're saying is we will stay at a 12-month. I mean, I think it has to be, you know, as a developer, you know, trying to get right. the multiple agencies and site plans and everything. So following up, okay, I'm going to, my last question before I open it up then, only because you opened up a question. So let's say you got the six month extension when the process of developing, but we don't have a capital commitment. Can we get another extension or do we have to go back and then reapply in round two? You would have to go back and reapply in round two. Okay. 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 Questions so from the just audience? From, like, uh, just echoing on that, so I think September 6th is the sunset yep. date. Um, so you know, the key takeaway for me on that is if you've secured all of your capital and you're assured that you have, um, then you wouldn't need to apply. If there's any kind of caution to that, um, you should apply if you, if you don't have the- No reason apply. not to, right? No reason not to. Right, so I'm, I, would, I would caution on the side of reapplying. So, and it's gotta be good. So the second one back there, you're first off with the arm. So just a question for clarification. Um, so if we have a, let's just say a 60 unit each I word, and the site we found and the homestead considerations, et cetera, whatever, uh, we're gonna use 30 in this first building that we get capital for. Do we lose the other 30 units or are they still in play but for the 12 month uh, period? So I got 60 units, I only can use 30 in this next, this building that's really happening today. Mm -hmm. So that leaves me 30, or did they get lost? They got lost. Okay. Right here. Um, sure. Um, I had a question going back to what you were talking about before, about sort of serving the whole person and, and not losing those lessons. And I'm sure you're aware of the coordinated assessment placement system yep. that's going on locally. How does Eshi, to get used to the right pronunciation, fit into the implementation of CAPS locally here in your sure. city and across the other continuums in the state? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, one of the questions people say, well, are the referrals different? You know, every population has a referral system within their community. And again, this is a statewide initiative. So, for example, with OMH, we have a SPOA in, you know, almost all of the states, so it will go through the SPOA. Each population has some sort of a referral system. New York City is looking at the CAPS uh, process. We've been engaged in conversations with them, and uh, we'll continue to work with them to see how this will fit in there. Has it been solidified? Oh, I'm sorry. Has it been solidified? Absolutely not. Uh, will it be solidified? Yeah, we'll, fi we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, and there's already, uh, in fact, I have a meeting set up with uh, Craig Retchless next Friday to uh, talk about it. Uh, but we're looking at it actively, and um, we don't want to place any additional burdens on any provider. We have to make sure it works for the individuals that it's necessary to be served under ESHI. Um, I'm faithful that there, everything will work in sync. How? I don't know, I'll get back to you on that, but it'll work. Um, my question is really um, a comment. I've been through two now when we've gotten through closings, and um, we thought that the state agencies worked absolutely beautifully together, and it was just an absolute pleasure. Um, not that closings are always complete. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the state agencies were incredibly helpful partners. One thing we did have trouble with was we were getting some of our Section 8 through a local housing authority. And their interpretation of um, uh, tenant selection rules 
particularly with regard to domestic violence, um, was very, very different. We thought they had an absurdly um, um, ungenerous um, interpretation of how to treat the, the people with uh, survivors of domestic violence. So we ended up, as we were running up, we really ran into trouble. And so I'm just wondering if there can be some education with some of the partners who are in the state but get their money from the federal government so that they can also understand, you know, the, the state's interpretation of why um, referrals need to happen a certain way. So yes, uh, uh, we don't have, in, 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 this was an ATJP project, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think in, in terms of educating and bringing in, you know, there were calls that were placed to our federal partners and at any time we can assist them, obviously, uh, project by project basis. But I think, you know, part of um, this conference and we, we did another one in New York City, we're intending to go to Rochester I think, mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. Um, and I know from OTDA, um, we're having our annual, um, uh, yeah, it's our annual kind of Bureau of Housing training that involves providers, continuums, funding partners, and that sort of stuff, that will continue to kind of carry that, that message, for sure. Thank you for coming. I appreciate the, um, the framing of the Ishai Awards as uh, approaching it with a level of flexibility, and I wondered if you could um, talk to us a little bit about what was the rationale, I know of two different projects where um, the site, the actual building changed and um, and the uh, recipient was told, you are not allowed to change the site, you right. have to reapply. Right. And, and frankly, you didn't have to have a site in order to apply in the beginning. So um, I just wondered, what was the rationale behind that decision? <coughs> that tied to the procurement itself and how the procurement was written. If, an, if a site was identified, then that site tied to the continuum of care. So um, if it was not identified uh, as a location in need. So for example, and we may be talking about similar projects, if, um, if the site was identified in the Bronx, the continuum supported a project in the Bronx. If the new site was in Queens, the RFP then did not support the continuum for it to be in Queens. If you had no site and the continuum wrote a general letter for New York City or a general letter of support for New York City, there was the flexibility on that. So, you know, we've clarified that uh, in the uh, new RFP as well. Because so, I was going to say, so the takeaway from that or the lesson learned is that in your continuum support letter, if correct. you are not 100% sure of your site, then either note the neighborhood or Correct. As broad, as broad as possible, mm -hmm. because otherwise. Right. And we didn't uh, we didn't foresee that coming. Okay. So um, that was I mean that's another lesson learned. You're right. Mm -hmm. But that was the rationale behind it. Thank you. Yep. Pascal. Uh, we have uh, Ishai conditional and permanent, um, but we haven't had any HHAP in the projects yet. And so my question was, my understanding previously had been a real difference between the definition of homelessness, between OMH and the HUD definition that was used previously. Has that come closer together? Can anybody comment on that? Sure. Sure, so um, first from an HJP perspective, HJP's homeless definition that had, has been greater than the HUD definition I think almost since inception, um, since 1983. Um, so it's, it's, HHAP has included populations that previously HUD uh, wouldn't necessarily recognize as um, homeless. In terms of the Ishai, um, and Moira and Sean, feel free to jump in. That was actually one of the first things that we tackled with. Moira opened up earlier that, you know, we all kind of had our own language and style and that sort of stuff. The very first thing that, that we did tackle as a work group was the homeless definition. 
and um, I think our the Ishai homeless definition um, is a bit more expansive. It marries with HJP for sure, um, and I think it's a little bit more expansive than HUD's definition for sure. It is. It, it uh, talks about people in life. Uh, uh, life's challenges. We wanted to make sure that we incorporated uh, the uh, young adult population who might be couch surfing, where in the past HUD wouldn't look at that, or you know, they, the individual who is at risk of homelessness because they're in a domestic violence situation, whereas they're not necessarily on the street or in a shelter, but um, they're at risk of homelessness at any moment. So those are some of the reasons we expanded it. Um, the other piece is institutionalization, whether that be coming out of a psychiatric center or whether that be coming out of a prison. So um, those are those are very similar, if not the same, as HHSP expansion. But Everything. yes, it's more expansive than HUD. Everything mentioned is eligible for HHSP. Yeah. Right here. Hi. Thanks. Um, just two quick questions. So, Maura, you mentioned for this next round at least 1,200. So does that mean like? The no, conditional no, no, no. awards it reapplying could possibly get on uh, this next round um, if approved. And then also, I'm just wondering for writ large the Ishai program, um, why Housing First wasn't necessarily, I guess, a requirement. I um, mean, that we know that it's you know evidence based. I know the MRT units have the Housing First, and I saw their evaluation that came out mm -hmm. last night. We saw some positive um, returns mm -hmm. for those of SMI, SUD, and so just wondering about the Housing First aspect of it. Good question. Thanks, Pascal. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you know, anybody, everybody, jump in here. Uh, at least, um, you know, I, I guess we can say that you know, if we have a request and more than twelve hundred, we'll take a look at that. You know, we won't say no. We'll say, okay, what can we do? How do we do it? How do we move this po these populations forward to be housed? So, you know, I don't know if you guys want to add to that, but that's really what the at least means, <coughs> all right? And um, as far as a housing first, you know, it's something that we have not tied into this as housing first. Um, and it's certainly something we can bring to the table to discuss. But again, I think that that might be one of the categories. But when you're talking about so many different populations and different population needs, um, that doesn't cover for everyone. It may cover for certain populations, so it could be uh, something that we build in next year um, into uh, the RFP. But thank you for bringing that to attention. But correct me if I'm wrong, Roy, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and Sean and everybody, the Housing First model is not um, excluded. So oh, yeah, right. not at so all. certainly right. it's an eligible partner. I'll just say it was just concerning in an earlier session and just, you know, folks were talking about if someone was inebriated, you know, would you kick them out, you know? And so yeah. there were just some language that I was just yeah. concerning and just, I think, particularly for an SUD, SMI population where we know it definitely works and for other populations, DV, you know, mm -hmm. IDD. Sure. So I think sure. it's something we should we could yeah. take into People can certainly put that in their RFP. They can certainly run Housing First programs. I think that's great. <laughs> I, I, have, I have three quick questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, are the per unit cost, the per unit amounts up to 25 still in the yeah. upcoming? Mm -hmm. Second is, would you be able to disclose the percentage upstate and downstate as far as split on the the, um, the prior round issue? Right? I don't have it here with me, so I can't, I can't, but I can tell you there was a range. Um, you know, based on population, based on area, you know, we had 15,000, we had 25,000, I couldn't tell you. No, no, I'm talking about just the number of applicants. Oh, 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 I don't know that at all. Just the, you know, like you had 50 up north and... I, I don't know that you know. off the top of my head here, okay. I'm sorry. Sean, um, uh, Project uh, Upstate uh, has all its permits in place, thinking of putting in an issue. Um, does it make sense to, uh, an early decision, by the way? And going in early because we're ready, you know, basically ready to go. Just need to get this piece put together. Uh, what would be your recommendation? Uh, uh, first thing, come and see us. You know, we always uh, encourage people to take the time, walk us through their application because once you submit, obviously there's a blackout period. You're going to be judged exclusively on what you submitted. 
Uh, but you know, as far as an early award candidate, one of the criteria that we require in order to apply for an early award is you demonstrate readiness to proceed to construction start within 120 days upstate, 180 days downstate. So if you got all your local approvals, you know, it sounds like a good candidate. We look forward to talking to you. I, I just want to kind of echo a, a little bit after um, Sean. I know that's very project specific, um, but in terms of AGJP, if you're contemplating submitting an application, uh, we have a concept paper process, which is really a, a very brief narrative. Uh, I see some kind of heads nodding. And that's a way to kind of engage us in, in a conversation, uh, particularly when the procurement's out on the street. Um, surround, the, surround, uh, the particulars surrounding your intended project. And um, I don't have an exact uh, percentage by, by any means, but um, those that engage in that concept paper process, we tend to see being more successful um, in terms of their application submittal because you, you know, we kind of talk our way through common pitfalls and, and some challenges that, that maybe we're, we're seeing through that process. So I really encourage uh, kind of using that process as well. Yeah, and Robert, one thing just to clarify. At this point, if you haven't talked to us, come in and talk to us. It's no, not going to be the full-blown technical assistance. Uh, that should wait until after our RFP is out the street so you see what the rules right. of the game are going to be. But never hesitate to put it on our radar, talk to us about concept. We can give you some early so we're, guidance. We're trying to go you. back and forth on four versus a nine and trying to, you know, juggle that. You know, yeah. If we're ready to go, permits can be picked up in October. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's the kind of big picture uh, orientation that an early conversation will get you. I mean, is it a 4% or a 9%? Uh, we can talk to you very early about that. Thank you. In the back. Hi. Um, big fan of Eshai, and you guys know all the regular <laughs> I like that. We like fans. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, the city also has service money. On the this is a question about service and capital money in the mm -hmm. Barry. Um, the city obviously has its own um, service units, which is, which is also good. Mm -hmm. Question really for Sean, I think, which is, um, I think something Brad had said in the past was that <coughs> to be eligible for the shop funding, you had to have an Eshai award. And I guess I wonder, is that still the case? And Brad who? What? <laughs> 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 God, he's gone. <laughs> Maybe in the audience. Yeah, he's right back. 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 I'm looking right at this. He's critiquing to see if we stayed in step with what he said. By the way, on his way up, he gave a bunch of commitments to people. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, last year, uh, that was the case. You know, if you look at through our uh, RFP on the unified funding round, uh, that was certainly the case. But one of the things that uh, I saw in this round was uh, we did a lot of ESHI uh, awards, but there was still a significant amount of supportive housing that we did that was beyond ESHI. There were you know, New York City funds that were out there, uh, and we made those deals work regardless of whether or not shop was involved. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is the strength of the way we put our uh, 9% program out there is there's so many different ways you can package based on the resources that are out there. And what we saw was there were successful applications, eShy or not, whether they had shop or not, they could use HTF, they could use Slick, they could use Lick. And you know, there's so many ways to package them. So um, I don't know what we're going to do going forward, um, but that is something you know that uh, people have asked us about before. And it's, one of those policy decisions that is uh, uh, is going to have to be decided. Way in the last row, I saw him go. Um, yeah, this is more of a comment than a question, and it may be a point that's evident to people already. But just dovetailing off of uh, Sue's comments earlier, and given the you know clarifying that the Eshai's definition of homelessness is more expansive than is HUD's. In those situations where developments have an award from a local PHA and, and are using those project-based vouchers and coupling that with eShi funds, I think it would be beneficial if, um, I don't know, if there was something in the RFP that would clarify which funds would rule in terms of 
the definition of homelessness because it adds a layer of com complexity in, yeah. in terms of navigating that piece with the local DHA. In terms of the tenant selection plan and lease up efforts. Well, I think one of the things that you'll notice as far as what's different this year in um, the RFP is that because the subsidy uh, is 20, up to $25,000, uh, that will be the subsidy. If you choose to take and apply for an ESHI subsidy, then you're not going to be eligible for Section 8. Oh, okay. Okay, so, um, and uh, it, it really those Section 8 uh, will be used for, you know, other projects, um, but the 25000 is to cover service and operating, um, and then that additional subsidy, um, it, pardon me? Oh, I thought somebody just said something. So that additional subsidy of Section 8, although it was in the first year, it was not clarified, uh, we have made it very clear in this RFP. So when you say not eligible for Section 8, do you mean through the state agencies or through local PHAs? Uh, as part, if you're receiving an ESHI subsidy, um, we would not uh, want you to also be receiving Section 8 because that's two of the same subsidy, really. Uh, its goal is the same, and that would be for rental stipends. Okay. For the same units. For the same units, correct. I think that's an important distinction for the same units that right. maybe would be covered under ESHI doesn't prohibit you from receiving Section 8 if it's a mixed use. Right, for affordable or yeah. whatever, but it's tied to the ESHI, yep. it isn't. So for the affordable units, you know, that's a different um, ball of wax. Um, I want to dig into the tracking, and, and Rick, you said uh, 741 or um, units so far. A lot, really less than a year into the original RFP, it's not short of amazing, so let's credit where credit is due. I, I wonder about, you know, if you, if you have an anticipated graph of how you're going to grow this to meet the ongoing 1200 and probably get to a point somewhere in year three or four where you're exceeding that just in order to make the five-year commitment of 6,000. I'm also, I also want to be crystal clear that my understanding, and I think the understanding that the panel is conveying is that the 6,000 unit commitment is 6,000 units of ESHI supportive housing, not something else that comes in that might have been from a previous uh, round of funding or, or anything else that might get counted into the equation. And then also wondering about the tracking of the ESHI funds in, in future budgets. I know that there's an initial, initial allotment of, uh, of funds that are going to cover the services for an undefined period of time. It's 124 million of settlement funds, is, if I remember correctly. What you know? How do we keep track, and when do we know, and which agencies will the funding increases show up in the state budget in, let's say, 2020 or whatever? Trick question. Was a lot of questions actually. Yes. There was three or four <laughs> trick questions. <laughs> so, so going back, you know, there's a commitment for six thousand ESHA units in five years. Right. That commitment has not changed. Okay. So um, we don't know what from now till September will bring to the table, and when we do a reflection post September and everything is reviewed as to what is up. Uh, we'll have those discussions about how we move forward. We know that year two, it's at least 12,000 units. Um, or 1,200. Tell the governor it's okay. We just we'll tell DOB. DOB. 12,000 units, guys. We're good, right? We're good? Okay, as long as we're good, that's all right. So, I was never a math person. I'm like that little social work thing. That's why I hang out with these guys and the people in my office. So, um, anyway, so that is the commitment. So, I, I want to state that. You know, I don't know if you want to talk about you know I think, future. I think we know we you know we're not through year one yet as you noted so I think and you know we have year one to finish and we have a lot of work to do in years two through five and we we know that and we're excited about it I don't remember your other questions right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask another question. sure sorry Go ahead. just a quick one for follow-up on Sean so is the state still um, in a position to not use shop if we're using New York City credits? 
still mm -hmm. not in position? Well, because can you get rid of the notable yeah. negatives? Yeah. <laughs> so, will the state entertain shop if you're using another New York City credit? You know, I, I think you know, and Karen, we've talked about this. In the past. No, I just wondered if it changed because you're talking about this RFP coming out. Yes. Yeah, no, time. and the RFP hasn't come out yet. And you know, I think what we do is uh, through. Every funding round, we accumulate the questions that come up, and we begin our policy analysis, and, and you know, come out with adjustments. And you know, I, I think one of the adjustments that we're going to make is based on what our production goals are. Are we getting there? Are there adjustments that need to be made to accelerate our, you know, our achievement of our goal? And that's definitely going to be something to look at. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm talking about an Eshai uh, project. In yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and so, I mean, if, you know, talk about lessons learned. You know, one of the big lessons that I learned, and I should have mentioned this up front, is no matter how well you plan, uh, you can't control your environment. Um, obviously, the credit equity market tanked um, due to some factors emanating from Washington. And you know that's something that presented a challenge, I think, for applicants and the agency. And so we're going to make adjustments. And uh, I know that's a question. It's certainly on the list of things that we're covering. Okay. I don't know where we're going to end up. Okay. Um, I'm running into some nimbyism on site uh, control issues. Mm -hmm. Surprising. Surprising. <laughs> <Not surprised. laughs> Wondering how much you're seeing of that being an impediment across the state to getting this done, um, and uh, whether you know HCR has new regional reps. To what degree you guys are out there advocating, you know, with us developers who are trying to get some uh, some neighborhoods that just you know don't think of people with these needs as being people they want to be neighbors with. You know, I don't know that you're going to change human nature anytime soon. Uh, you know, there are those elements in any community. Uh, I think really Shinny and their membership organizations are a good resource in, in terms of strategies you can do to engage your community. Um, you know, but there are some elements that you're never going to win, win over. But I would suggest, you know, there, there are some very successful organizations and I've heard them talk to me about the strategy they, they use in engaging a community. I would talk with them. Um, it will obviously be supportive, but you know, uh, there's limits to what we can do as well. And certainly, um, you know, we have faced that over many, many, many years working with uh, individuals with mental illness, and uh, again, reaching out to us, and we can direct you to agencies who have been successful. Um, it is a challenge; it continues to be a challenge. But with each challenge, there's an opportunity for success. So, and we have seen that across the board uh, throughout the state consistently, but it is a difficult uh, road to walk at times. Yeah. Bill? Just to comment on that, you know, that's what I do all the time, is, is do the community engagement, and it is an educational component, and constant conversation, et cetera. But our messaging really is important, and when like a letter comes out, you know, we do this whole understanding of the community talking about linkages, what are they, also about background checks, and really just trying to let people know we're building safe communities of people that are going to get services, but we all know people. But when the messaging isn't helping sometimes from the governor's office, when a letter comes out that calls people homeless psychiatric patients, which just came out recently. So, you know, there, it's hard because it's, when people see a homeless psychiatric patient, that pushes buttons for people, you know what I mean? So it can kind of, so we really need to be closely paying attention to our messaging together. Um, so I just want to keep that on all of our radars together. I have a question that was texted mm -hmm. to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, can you use, uh, if you have 40 Eshai units, all different populations, can HHAP support or be used to construct all of the different populations, all 40 units, right? Um, 
So this is a shameless way for me to acknowledge someone that I didn't do earlier. Brenda, back here, please stand up. Wait. <laughs> please stand up real quick. Can you answer that question? We certainly can. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Why bring that up? I, I'm sorry. Uh, we noticed, I noticed in HHAP applications that there were groups, example, 40 ESHA units, 20 mental health, 12 veterans, 8 domestic violence, and the group only came into HHAP for the domestic violence and the veterans thinking that was the OTDA population. Right. So the clarification I'm okay. just trying to make is all 40 units are still homeless, OMH would still be your contract and service agency, but all 40 units could be HHAP. That was the reason I planted that, so thank you. <laughs> and I just want to piggyback on what Dana just said. That being said, if you're committed to 40 units, 20 mental health, 8 D domestic violence, you know, 10 OASIS, that doesn't change. You can't say, well, you know what, I couldn't get a lot of mental health clients in here, so I'm going to put 15 uh, domestic violence uh, and, you know, seven. It, it's what you're committed to is the commitment for eternity. Okay. <laughs> At least my eternity. So, <laughs> um, so there's no, you, you're committed to that amount of units for that population served. Okay. What if you were to do a homeless uh, population based on uh, the, the needs assessment? Uh, kind of open-ended without indicating individual disability subgroups. So. so you would check that you were doing chronic homeless, yeah. period. Right. That's, you have to pick a category. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. And there, there's been instances, um, I'm just kind of following up on what Moira was saying, uh, that there's been instances that projects during their pursuit of securing <coughs> capital actually increase the number of units um, for chronic homeless families. And with the conditional awards, um, we were able to successfully, uh, when they moved to final award, um, increase the ESHAC number of units because it was based on the capital um, and the number of um, units that were required to satisfy the, the capital need. And we were able to, when we went to final award increase the number of units associated under ESHA. And that isn't done by one agency, that is done by our work group. Yep. So that example would be brought on Tuesday afternoon to the work group, we would discuss it, see if it made sense, have the supporting back up to it, and then agree or disagree that it would change. Right. And again, that's been like a small number and it's been it's very kind of um, around Olmstead and kind of um, meeting the target population's needs and mixed use mm -hmm. kind of, uh, properties. I'm going to ask, a, I've got one question I want to make sure it gets answered before we leave, so, but we will get to you. So, no, probably I was the most excited this morning, Commissioner Sullivan talked about OMH pre-development dollars. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So how, when is that coming out? How do we access it? And uh, is it just for the mental health populations? Okay. At this point, it is right now just for the mental health populations. And why is that? Um, and that's because we also went through a transition. If everyone remembers, we had uh, capital funding. And one of the um, key parts of our capital funding was working with not-for-profit developers to be able to access that pre-development uh, funds to move forward to HCR. When uh, we transformed our process, uh, we had conversations on a commissioner level and it was decided that we would have some pre-development dollars to continue to offer to individuals. We've been work individual agency. We've been working over the course of a year or so to work on how that would actually work, where would the money come from, what are the mechanics around it, and what's the implementation process. We are um, we have we have made common agreement across the board, and uh, probably within the next week there'll be a letter being sent out. Uh, with the specifics around it. Okay. Uh, We're finalizing um, some little nuances that we have to take care of, but then it'll be set to go. Uh, we will work with uh, HCR and whatever other capital agency may be involved to jointly evaluate how this money will be uh, awarded uh, to individuals, but you will have to have at least a conditional award to be able to take a look at that. Terrific. Okay. Question back here. Um, sorry. 
Sean, as you were saying that uh, HDR has gained stronger understanding of the different kinds of supportive housing, and as HDR learns the different levels of the different agencies, levels of supportive housing, and the need for capital funding in these ESHI awards, what would be your suggested time frame for project owners to come in and start talking about the services they're proposing in the buildings in coordination with your programs? In coordination. With, with your programs. So when would, should they come in and start talking about those programs in the HDR buildings? I think once they have a clear idea of how they're going to proceed, the sooner the better. Uh, and again, uh, I look at it as a two-stage process. Right now, anybody who's got a clear idea of where they're headed, they should be calling us up and talking to us about uh, you know, their basic concept, and we give them feedback on whether we think it's best as a 4% or a 9%. And it's at that point, if you've got a very clear idea of target population, level of services you want to be providing, let us know, and quite frankly, if we know that going in, we'd invite the contracting agency or who we suspect would be the contracting agency to come and have a joint meeting. So we love when developers have a very clear picture and are ready to talk to us and we have everyone in the room. We provide much better uh, TA and quite frankly, you increase the success of your application if you do that. And just again, piggybacking on what you just said there is that although the capital agency, uh, maybe HEGP or HCR, um, it is very much the understanding that the service agency will be a partner with that capital agency. So uh, from the get-go, we will be sharing anything and everything together and really responding to you jointly. Um, so, you know, we're on the exact same page, so there's not uh, going to be any, I hope, not going to be any kind of missing of information. And uh, I think that's important, that it's Although they're two different processes, you know, step one, step two, it's still interconnected. I'm going to take one more question from the audience, then I have one final question, and uh, we'll break. Yeah. They're done. Great. Just ask. Okay. <laughs> this is it. Um, so the terms of the Eshi are five years. Yeah. What happens after the five years? It's renewed. Okay. Good. We're done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The only, way, the only way it wouldn't get renewed is if people weren't doing the job they said they were going to do. Similar right? to the way the right? existing OMH supported policy. It, it's no different than what OMH has been doing for the last 30 years and other agencies have been doing for the last 30 years. Right? Let's give a round of applause to our family.